Hello everyone and welcome to the Chrissy B Show. So today we have some hard-hitting topics to cover as we speak with founder of Enough Abuse, Marilyn Hawes, who will be telling us all about internet grooming and how to keep children safe online. We'll also be showing you a video from Head Talks on the story of Paul Skates of abuse but eventual recovery. And as always, we also have on Dr. Rob Hicks to answer your most pressing medical questions. And careers coach Chris Brown will be talking to us about how to manage big ego in the workplace and at the end of the show I'll also be giving you some tips on how to get involved with charities without needing to spend too much money but up first we have the lovely Chelsea Baker on who is of course our business mentor on this program and founder of National Mentoring Day hello Chelsea hey Chrissy lovely, lovely to, to be see here see you again how are you <laughs> I'm very well thank you you must be very busy because obviously National Mentoring Day is coming up again third year now isn't it it's in its third year yeah. and it's four weeks away and the excitement is building it's really going well at the moment Amazing. so so many people wanting to get involved which is lovely mm -hmm. first of all before we get into the actual day itself can you tell us um, why mentoring is important Mentoring is so important, it's so valuable. Can you imagine if you set up a business and you don't know what direction to turn, you know, you've never done it before. Mm -hmm. All those feelings of anxiety, stress and worry that compound when you're launching a business. I mean, of course, I'm a business mentor. I've mentored mm -hmm. over 200 companies. So I've seen firsthand the difference that, yeah. you know, mentoring has on people and the impact is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's now with all walks of life. We've got careers mentoring. We've got mentoring for ex-offenders. We've got mentoring for children, mm -hmm. uh, students, college, you know, if you're in college or university, the problems that you have when you're studying and going through, yeah. uh, you know, the trials and tribulations of life as a student, okay. if you had a mentor to speak to or turn to, it can really Make excel you uh, and get you where you want to be far quicker, far faster. What's the actual aim of National Mentoring Day? The aim of National Mentoring Day is to really celebrate and recognize the impact and benefits mm -hmm. of mentoring. And until National Mentoring Day, there was hundreds and if not thousands of mentoring initiatives, not only in England, but all around the world. Yeah. But nobody's really communicating and connecting with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so the aim of the day is that they're sharing best practice tips, yeah. success stories, and you yeah. know, really um, having that shared vision and that collaboration, I think is absolutely key if we're going to advance yeah. mentoring. But what's actually happened during these three years? Because obviously you started off and how how has it been building up? Well, you were at one of the events at the House yeah, of Lords. Amazing, that was yeah. phenomenal. We had uh, an event the year before that in a mentoring hub. Mm. And now what's happening is this year, simultaneously, can't say that word, simultaneously, <laughs> on the 27th of October, there is events happening up and down the country. Mm. I mean, today I had... Um, the uh, Welsh government, they're putting on an event at Glyndale. I've, in fact, I had a, a little roundup um, that mm -hmm. I did here. Yeah, the Welsh government are holding a mentoring conference at Glyndale University. Yeah. We've got um, NatWest, they're putting on an event in Manchester to celebrate and thank all their yeah. mentors. Uh, the British Library, they recently really? contacted me and they're putting oh, wow. on some mentoring activities in all the libraries throughout the country. Yeah, amazing. And uh, there's a fantastic online mentoring summit that's mm -hmm. taking place with the mentoring school and what they're doing is interviewing mentors from all over the world and, and finding out you know what drives people to mentor Brilliant. and this year I suppose one of the big advancements is that we've had um, a huge company in Hong Kong get involved and they're doing a big national conference in uh, Turkey, in New Mexico, and it's really really growing into a global Amazing. brand. So, so how can people get involved? They can get involved by our wonderful Get Involved Guide that we've got here. So in terms of the Get Involved Guide, it's really packed with information if you're a business, if you're mm. a community, an individual. And uh, there's 35 ways to get involved. Okay. Uh, whether that be setting up a mentoring event, webinar, Q&A session, talk, networking event. Amazing. And I guess really it's about saying, putting your hand up and saying, actually, I need a mentor. Uh, mm -hmm. For those people who feel that they have some time to give or some knowledge experience uh, to hand over and, and mentor yeah, somebody. Brilliant. So it's really a, uh, a wonderful 
day to really get involved and say, right, I want to be a mentor. I want to yeah. get mentored. Brilliant. Chelsea, thank you so much. And we're looking to forward to talking to you after National Mentoring Day and catching up again what's happened. Absolutely. And I'm don't sure forget, hashtag National Mentoring Day. That's yes. where the activity is happening. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Chelsea. Chelsea. <laughs> All right, guys, we're well, still to come on the show. We have founder of Enough Abuse, Marilyn Hawes, to talk about her work in child abuse prevention. We've also got a video from Mental Health Podcast Head Talks and Dr. Rob Hicks will be on the show to answer your pressing medical questions. But up next, we have coach Chris Brown to talk about managing big egos and conflict in the workplace. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hi, Chrissy. So dealing with big egos, dealing today's topic. Big egos. Yeah. Ego in the workplace, to be exact. Okay. Yeah, um, egos. At the end of the day, when you break down the word ego itself, it's talking about mm. someone with a self, um, sort of self-importance about yourself, yeah. that way of thinking, right? Now, to have that in a workplace is a bit tricky, you know, because you've got to work mm. with each other yeah. and you're dealing with different egos. Now, when you think about it, you th you've got this situation here where somebody has got a big ego, right? Mm. And a confrontation starts, yeah. right? You've got the two choices. It's fight or flight or aggressive or passive. Either mm. way, what happens is one or the other ends up in conflict, right? Yeah. It could be subliminal conflict, but there's conflict there. And after someone blows and lose control, what do you do? You feel bad about it later on. Mm -hmm. So we've got to work out how can we deal with these different egos. We can't take the ego out of person, but we've got to recognize each individual, who they are and how we can yeah. actually communicate with them. There's a good, um, who is it? Eric Byrne. Right, he's a psychiatrist, right, and he worked out the transactional analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm going to show here is just a little bit of that, but show how we ourselves can actually work with people and find different ways of doing things. Okay. Right, so I'm going to Hi. show you a few examples here. Okay. Right? Let's okay, go. let's have a look at this slide. Right, so here we are. Egos in the workplace, right? We've got three states here. Now, mm. the three states we're talking about, the P, the A, and the C, but it's already up here already. We've got yeah. parent, adult, and child, right? Now, at the end of it, you can see we've got what? This is the characteristic of the individual, right? So yeah. each one of us have this kind of state, but we switch between them. Some are more dominant oh. in individuals, yeah. right? So, parent. Usually you'd say, well, the parent's right, quite critical and nurturing, mm -hmm. right? That is a characteristic of an individual, right? So we've got the adult, and the adult is a rational, and is a thinker as well. Mm -hmm. He or she's a thinker as well. And then you've got the child personality, which is spontaneous, happy, and angry. And I'll put in the end of that, sulky sometimes okay. as well, right? I'm just adding that on there, yeah. right? Okay, now you think about this. This is the characteristics of different individuals, mm -hmm. right? We're not saying it's fixed, it fluctuates, but you can tell roughly when talking to someone what sort of person they are, what they're fit on. Okay. So you've got to work out how would I actually respond to them. All right, let's have a look at the other slide. That explains. Right, so here we are. We've got the manager and employee. Mm -hmm. Now, if I didn't say the manager and employee, I could say the manager and the assistant, whichever way you want to put it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's just say this individual over here was yourself and you wanted to go in and ask for a pay rise or you yeah. wanted to go and discuss something really critical. So you've got to work out, well, how would I approach this person? Now, we've got this person as a P, mm -hmm. right? This person here, their personality, as we said before, right? We're talking about critical and we talk about nurturing. Yeah. So would you go into this person as a P as well? Or would you go in as an A to deal with them? Or would yeah. you go in as a C? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So how would we approach that person to get the best results out mm -hmm. of them? Right. Now, we've got to remember these are ego states that each individual has. So let's go on to the next one and explain how we'd go about this. Right. So here we go. Now, if we were going to say parent to parent, you see at the end of these arrows, You've got it going both ways. There could be a little bit of a clash, mm -hmm. right? So I've got to work this person out and think, well, how am I going to approach them? If I'm going to ask them for this pay rise situation, I've got to work with them instead. So the ego, I might go in as an adult. Oh, mm -hmm. Now, if you think about what we said about the adult being a rational thinker, I went in there to ask about this pay rise, but I can actually really define why I should have this. Yeah. Right, and be very clear with them. Then being the parent nurturing sort of way, I can 
break through that in that sense, right? Or let's put it this way. What if the manager was childlike, right? So would I go in as a child as well? Chances are no, nobody's gonna come out there. Everybody's spontaneous, happy, emotional, just getting on with it at the end of the day. Would I go in as an adult? What do you mm. think? Would I go in That's as an adult? a complicated one. Oh, all right. Maybe, maybe a parent. Maybe a parent? Yeah. Interesting, that is interesting because the fact about it is, you could, yes, because the child started going to actually listen to you as a parent, mm -hmm. but then the other thing, there's the adult, there's that respect and being rational and being direct. So both of them. Okay. So you've got to work out what sort of person you deal with to deal with these egos at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I remember running a workshop and there was something like 15 people or so, and we were all asking each other like, uh, so what do you think this person is? What do you think that person is? And what, what do you, are you a P, are you an A, That's are you a C? I was just wondering actually yeah, about saying. myself. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say you are? Um, can you go back to the first slide just so I can remember what, it, so it was parent was critical right. and nurturing. nurturing. Rational. It's like you said, Chris, you can be, so I can be all those right. in different situations, uh, so depending on where I am and who I'm with. Right. and what I'm doing. So it's, it's quite... Um, okay, but it must be a dominant one if that, you ask somebody uh, else. What would you say? I would say a cross between A and P, to be honest. Really? Yeah. That is interesting. That but is then interesting. when I'm at home... <laughs> you're back to that one. It's a child, <laughs> spontaneous and like... You change with the environment at yeah. the time and who you're with and who yeah. you're related to. But then if you turned around, let's just say we did turn around, I'll see everybody in the studio, their point of view and said, well, what am I or who am I? It kind of reflects even more because we in ourselves and egos, we say, well, I'm like this, I'm like that. But yeah. then we've got to see somebody else's view at the same time. Okay. I remember in a workshop and they said, well, what are you after I asked everybody else? And um, <laughs> quite a lot of them said, you're an adult, <laughs> like that. And yeah. then someone says, no, I think he's a parent instead yeah, and yeah. things like that, you know. So it's it like kind of very... fluctuates really, you know. Okay. So we're talking about ego states, right? And ego in a workplace. Mm -hmm. So this sort of thinking will help you to avoid those conflictions that okay. you actually have and resolve a lot of it okay. in that way. So, so I'm well thinking prepared. That, yeah, that's it. Be prepared Brilliant. who you're dealing with. Work All them right. out. Chris, yeah. thank you so much. That was really interesting. Pleasure, Chrissy. And we'll see you again very soon. <laughs> Thank you. Well, everyone, don't go away because after the break, we have more for you, including Marilyn Hawes, who will be talking about her work in preventing child abuse. But first, how many charities were active in the UK as of June 2017? Was it A, 22,345, B, 84,986, or C, 166,963? Find out the correct answer after this break. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone. Now, before the break, we spoke with business mentor Chelsea Baker about her plans for National Mentoring Day. And coach Chris Brown gave us some great advice on dealing with big egos and conflict in the office. And next up, we've got Marilyn Halls on the show to talk about how to keep your children safe online. But first, before the break, I asked you, as of June 2017, how many registered charities were operating within the UK? Was it A, 22,345? B, 84,986, or C, 166,963? Well, I can tell you that the answer is C. According to the government's charity registry office, there are currently 760,000 paid employees in the charity sector. The combined income of charities is about 39 billion pounds a year, and charities add more value to the UK economy than either the arts or agricultural <coughs> sectors. So some very interesting facts there. So now it's time to talk to the wonderful Marilyn Hawes of Enough Abuse, who won an award recently. Yes, and what a surprise. Actually, it's surreal, and thank you for voting. I understand no you problem. voted. Yes, so, I did. Yes, most inspirational. What was the award? Tell us Most about inspirational it. woman of 2017. Wow. So, so that was um, a recognition for all your hard work that you are doing, yes, Marilyn, because, you know, it's so important. It really wasn't for me. I mean, it felt surreal. I was in shock. I've never won anything in my life. <laughs> um, but it was for the charity and yeah. the children we help, and the votes came in from all around the globe. So that Amazing. was really uh, something to take on board and process. So you're back on the show today to help Thank our you. viewers once again, this time um, to talk about the internet. So yeah. uh, we know that, you know, social media and the internet has changed quite a bit over the years, hasn't it? Well, if I was to say to you, uh, 100,000 
IP that's the internet providers addresses mm -hmm. are downloading in the UK. A hundred thousand of them are downloading child abuse images every oh day God. in the UK. Yeah. And there's 83 million fake Facebook sites around the world wow. and the children just don't know what they're getting into. And no one's saying don't use the internet. Mm -hmm. No one's saying and I want to spoil your fun, mm -hmm. but if you drove a car dangerously, you're likely to harm someone. Yeah. And this is the same, that children and parents need to understand the underbelly of the internet, what goes on in the dark web, mm -hmm. what should you, should you not, you, and the youngsters are thinking in the now. And yeah. you've got to be looking five, 10 years down the track, if I post that online, what's going to happen. Okay, so can you tell us uh, maybe some of the, the common ways that predators are actually using to, to get to children online? Well, they are incredibly clever. They are IT savvy. They may have nine or 10 different laptops and um, accounts open at any time. And they're fishing for children who will take the bait. And it's called cat fishing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why, but it's called cat fishing. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for vulnerability. The same with offline grooming. And if they wish to target, uh, say it's 12 year old, Mm -hmm. They will dress like a 12 year old. They will get a voice distorter like a 12 year old. They will wow. follow the speak of a 12 year old, the body movements of a 12 year old. They have a heavy disguise like a 12 year old and they will purport to be the friend. They will access the Facebook. Nothing is secure on social media and that's the clue, social media. It was mm -hmm. never meant to be secure. And that's right. the trouble. People go, oh, I've got a privacy setting. Oh, I've got, you know, I've got this, I've got that. Everything is hackable. And even if you think, well, I'll put my photographs in the cloud, where mm. it would be safe, a Microsoft thing, that would be fair. But if that's linked to your ordinary email address, it can still be hacked into. Wow. And you have to understand that everything I put out there is hackable. I can access your webcam and switch it on from 5,000, whenever, miles away, if I've hacked into your password, everything is hackable. And a little girl the other day, a year seven child, say to me, well, I was doing online gaming, which is another thing, uh -huh. hugely populated by child abusers. And she didn't understand. She said to me, this little red light came on while I was playing this online game and it kept coming on and going off. And, oh and then when it came on, I could hear men laughing and talking. I went, sweetheart, you've been hacked. Oh and she was like, what? I mean, the fact remains half these children under the age of 13 shouldn't even be on no, social no. media. And that's something I think parents have forgotten to say no and mean yeah. it. And I know I'm a dinosaur, but I had to say no to my children mm -hmm. over things that were relevant at the time. And children need boundaries. Yeah. And every mother in every generation, no doubt, has heard, you know, everyone else's mother. Yeah, well, this mother's, I care. I want you to stay as safe as possible. What, what, maybe what are the, the, some of the common signs that someone is being groomed online, say if you are a parent or teacher, what, is there anything that you can look out for? Get very withdrawn, anxious, secretive, um, stupid little things they should be asking, like why does your child always keep their mobile phone face down? Why does mm. it rush out the room when it gets a message? The check, you're looking at the changes of behavior, those negative changes. Is your child taking their eye tablet, their thing to, to, to bed at night and you'll see if the little blue shaft of light from the laptop's on. You know, are they up late? What's going on? Why does the child need to be late online? Mm -hmm. Are there suspicious things coming in the post that the child's quickly trying to get the post away and take something out of what's being delivered? Is there something being sent? Are they mysteriously moving around? But the, the clue, the anxiety, all children are the same. If they think mum's going to find out okay. and be in trouble, you're going to be edgy. Yeah. And, you know, the change of the behaviour and, you know, just check and nose around and ask questions. Ask your children, what social media platform are you on? Yeah. I mean, it's just, the grooming is the same, but it's rapid befriending. It's instant. And the, the sexual comments are immediate. There's no like warm up like offline grooming. It's immediate. And, you know, Snapchat. Oh, mm -hmm. Snapchat, if you don't turn uh, the ghost mode, you know, the ghost mode, oh, high, so otherwise you're going to be reason. located. Yeah. But, you know, Instagram now has been rated the worst app for mental health problems because of the mm -hmm. high level of bullying. 
you know, if, if you people with um, special needs learning difficulties are 16% more likely to suffer from cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. And it's brutal. Anyway, if I said to you now, 30 min every 30 minutes throughout the day in the UK, a child seriously or permanently harms themselves because they did not have the robustness to take any more bullying online. Wow. Now, when I train the children, I say to them, you've got to think about this. This isn't funny. This isn't just teasing in the playground that yeah, you can yeah. stop. When does teasing become bullying? It's when you're asked to stop. But the trouble is with online stuff like Snapchat and Instagram, you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. It just goes on and on and on. And if you haven't got that robustness, and I, and I say to the children, how would you feel if someone you didn't even know that well because you thought it was cool, that your comment was the last thing they ever heard wow. before they left this planet? And if you feel that wouldn't bother you, then you need to take a really good look mm -hmm. at yourself because this could be your sister and someone doing it to you or your brother. That's right. And you need to understand what it's doing. I mean, youngsters on Musical.ly, that's another hotspot, um, musical.ly. And the, the girls do all these videos. And, um, and there's a school in Dorchester that's um, been targeted by a paedophile ring mm -hmm. with 10 year olds shouldn't be on Musical.ly. Dancing and doing videos, all girls love to dance, and boys, they shouldn't be on it. No. And it's again highly populated by paedophiles who are taking the videos and putting it in the dark web. Marion, can I just ask you something? With with the, the predators, what is it that they're actually their main goal? Is it to get pictures of the children or to actually meet with the children? What is it that their main any goal of it, is? Any of right, it, any of it, sex. Mm -hmm. Any of it, to watch it, to get off on it, um, to cause harm. I, what irritates me is when people say, oh, I was only looking. No, you weren't only looking. You were watching a child being sexually abused. So you've got three categories on the Copine scale. You've got category A, which is really hardcore. I mean, that involves... Um, Oh, it's just horrific. Look it up. I wouldn't dare say it because mm -hmm. it's going out on air. But it's the worst sort of thing you could even imagine. And then there's category B, which is also filming, um, but uh, not penetrative. And then you've got category mm -hmm. C. Now, category C are like the static ones where these people are procurers. They go photoshopping. Right, so they will look at all child-centric organizations, school websites, oh my word, classic. And if you've got pictures on your websites, on your Facebook page, that, oh, thanks very much, it's not secure, I can hack in, I can take that face, I can find a swimming club and maybe find a torso and other children's arms and legs, oh I cut brush God. and airbrush it, create a static image like a girly magazine, and off it goes into the dark oh web, goodness. where people are buying these for their personal gratification, mm. let's put it that way. But how, what's the best thing then that parents can do, apart from obviously watching out for the signs, what then, how can they keep children safe? They've just got to have the conversation with them, which is why you know, so many parents say to me, which is why I've started this course now, come mm. with your child yeah. and let's break down that generation gap. Yes, it's running fast, the internet, but mm. you have got to learn and you've got to start saying no and you've got to explain why. No one wants to spoil their fun, but we are going to have a curfew. You know, if you've gone, and the University of Cambridge did um, a, a research last year and they came out and, and have shown that 14 year olds after they've done all their homework and stuff like that which obviously would involve the internet to some mm. extent if you're playing an hour a day on leisure games at seven hours during the week you are likely and you're 14 years old you are likely to drop your GCSEs by nine points wow. now mm -hmm. if you don't get the top three grades for maths and English at GCSE you're not even going into the sixth form mm -hmm. And then you go to the sixth form and maybe you then need to do two hours a day on leisure games, thinking you've got more gaps in your timetable maybe. Mm -hmm. And you're likely to drop 18 grades. And what these children don't realize that, oh, my three A's, maybe now two, a, two B's and a C. Yeah. So you don't go to your university of choice. You maybe go to clearing. And you know, it doesn't matter, I got to university anyway. But when you come out, and you apply online to a blue chip company, you could have a first class honours degree, but it's your UCAS points at A-level 
that are mm. going to get you through yeah. that door for yeah. recruitment and the computer will say no and there's all this educated stuff has got to be out there and so the training we do is think 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 what are the consequences mm. of you putting a sexting image out online of your body you know I, I had a lad the other day he was um 15 good looking boy and he said to me what if I put a nude photograph of myself to my girlfriend and I said well let's assume you have because you've said what <laughs> yeah. you know you've got a friend have you <laughs> the magic friend yeah. and um he said, well, what's the problem I said well would you show your granny no mm. would you show me no and I said are you going to marry this girl no and I said well, let me tell you something big lesson to learn about women don't hack them off because mm. when you do we can be quite vicious. So yeah. you're not going to marry her, fine. She's 15 years old. Yeah. So you maybe dump her in three weeks' time. What's she going to do, possibly, with that, that image? Photo, yeah. And you're going to find it all over YouTube. She's not allowed to, really. It's against the law now. But once it's out there... That's it. He went scarlet. I said, sorry, I can't help you. You can't get your images back. You don't mm -hmm. own them. Facebook does. YouTube does. All social media owns the images. Think before you post it. Brilliant. Marilyn, thank you so much. Again, very thought provoking. <laughs> thank you. And we look forward to having you on again to educate all of thank us. You. About I'll get the a dangers. life one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, guys, so uh, if you'd like to know more about Enough Abuse, please do visit our website, chrissybshow.tv. So we're now going to go for a short break, but don't go away because we'll be sharing an incredibly powerful story of Paul Skates, who's telling what he went through with abuse and mental health struggles. And we also have Dr. Apix on the show answering all of your pressing medical questions. But first, what percentage of doctors working in the UK are women? Is it A, 35%, B, 47%, or C, 50%? 6%. Find out the answer after this break. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone. Now, before the break, we had Chelsea Baker on talking about National Mentoring Day. And Marilyn Hall spoke to us about the extremely important work she's doing with her organization, Enough Abuse, which aims to teach parents and teachers on the most common signs of child abuse. And now we have our very own resident doctor, Rob Hicks, in the studio to answer your most pressing medical questions. But first, before the break, I asked you what percentage of doctors working in the UK are women? Is it A, 35%? B, 47% or C, 56%? Well, I can tell you that the answer is C, 56%. This is a massive increase since the 1960s because there were fewer than 10% of UK doctors that were actually female. So now things are very different and over 60% of students accepted into medical schools are female. And it's thought that within the next decade, there will actually be more female than male doctors working in the UK. What do you reckon, Rob? Wow. Did you know that? I, d I knew the, the numbers had increased, but I yeah. hadn't realised that they'd tipped over. It's interesting, isn't it? I think it's fascinating. And it's good, actually. Yeah. Don't worry, we won't be out of a job, though, will you? Well. We'll always have you here on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yes. So we've got some questions for you, Rob, from some of our viewers. And if you do have a question for our lovely doctor here, you can email us on doctor at chrissybshow.tv. So the first question, this person's asking, I will often feel very cold in my hands and feet most of the time. What is causing this? You know what, that's a really common question that you know people ask in practice. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is that often it's just part of you. This is just something that is, is part of your, your makeup and it's nothing really to be concerned about. Um, it's, you know, people know, have it pointed out to them that, oh, your hands feel cold. And then they start you know, thinking, oh, my hands are feeling cold. Um, but generally speaking, so long as it's not associated with other symptoms, you know, like pins and needles or pains or, or, or difficulty moving you know, the feet or the hands, then generally speaking, it's just part of your makeup. There is a condition called Raynaud's uh, phenomena where when exposed to cold, the, 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 the hands, the feet, actually the earlobes and the tip of the nose, 
um, can become very uncomfortable. They turn from, from white to blue to, to mm -hmm. red. And that's because the, the blood vessels get narrow. Um, and, you, and often there's no underlying cause for that. Um, but it is a condition that can make life a bit difficult. But what I would say to you is if, if you're getting, if you're worried about your cold hands and your cold feet, the good idea is to have a checkup to make sure there isn't an underlying problem causing it. But in the meantime, obviously, you know, keep those parts of your body warm, you know, thick socks, gloves, for example, do lots of exercise, don't smoke and manage stress because particularly with Raynaud's, it's not just cold exposure that causes the symptoms, it's actually being stressed as well. Um, so those are the sort of things to think about. Okay, thank you, Rob. You can sip your tea, by the way, I'm reading the next one. It's a bit of a longer one. So, hi, Rob. Why does my skin itch and go red when I do high-impact exercise? I'm not new to working out, and it doesn't happen all the time, but it can be quite uncomfortable having to scratch during a workout. Yeah, it can be uncomfortable. It can be a bit embarrassing as well if you're having mm -hmm. to scratch during a workout. Um, one of the reasons behind this is thought to be the release of a chemical called histamine, which when we, when we exercise... Um, is, is released to, to try and help prevent um, fatigue um, and, and over muscle exertion. Now, the thing about histamine is, is you're probably aware is that it's the chemical that's involved with allergy responses as well. So it triggers itching, a rash, um, and a number of other symptoms. So that's the sort of thing that, that might be happening. Um, what you could try and do if, if it's becoming so distressing that it's putting you off exercise is you could try taking an, an antihistamine tablet to block the histamine response to see if that makes a difference. Um, and, and, and that's the sort of thing to think about. With regards to the scratching, you mentioned that you know it's embarrassing to scratch. I, ideally, maybe take some cream with you to the gym where you can just apply the cream because when you scratch, you actually trigger further release of histamine. So you get into this vicious cycle. Histamine triggers the itch, you scratch, you trigger more histamine and so on and so on. Whereas if you take some cream and just rub it gently into the itchy part of the skin with the pads of your fingers, um, that will relieve the itch but not trigger more histamine. I mean, if this is, uh, you know, there are other symptoms as well, particularly allergy symptoms, then, then get a checkup. But that, I think that's probably what's behind your, your concern. Okay, thank you. Next question, Rob. Why does my shoulder hurt every time I put pressure on it? Ah. <laughs> Well, um, more often than not, this sounds like you may have injured it, even if you're not aware of that or you've overdone it with the shoulder. And I would suggest that you get that checked out if it's, if it's you know, hurting every time you put pressure on it. Well, you know, presumably when you lie down to go to bed, if you're on your shoulder, it's hurting. Um, and I would certainly advise you not to do any um, heavy lifting or any exercise that involves that shoulder until you've had it checked out. It could be a bone problem, it could be a ligament problem, it could be a tendon problem, it could be a muscle problem. The, the, the shoulder is actually a very complex joint and, and lots and lots of things can go wrong with it. Um, and the longer you leave it, and if it does need treatment, then it could be a case of the harder it becomes to treat and resolve the problem. So get that checked out and, and don't put any undue pressure on that shoulder until you have done. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Um, this, per this person's asking, how soon can I go back to running after breaking a bone in my foot? We've got a sports yeah, theory tonight, a, a sort of idea tonight, <laughs> haven't we? Um, well, well the idea, this very much depends on how, what bone you broke, how badly you broke it, and what treatment you needed for, 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 the, for the bone. So I think the question really needs to be directed at the doctor or the orthopedic surgeon who's looking after you for that fracture. Generally speaking, it takes somewhere between about six to eight weeks for a bone in the foot to heal fully. Now saying that, that doesn't mean you'll necessarily be able to go back to running you know, after that period of time, you may be advised to go through some physiotherapy and rehabilitation before you start running again, particularly if that's a, what's called a stress fracture in one of the, the bones in the foot that may have been caused by running in the first place. Things to think about when you do go back to running, obviously make sure that your the footwear, the running shoes are, you know, are, are supporting your feet, that you know, they're not 10 years old. Um, and actually that you're making sure that you warm up beforehand and you do your stretches and you cool down afterwards. Okay, and another question, another sports related one. Um, can foot massages help athletes? I think the answer to that is yes. Okay. Um, and what, what, fuss, what massage of muscles, whether in the feet or anywhere else, does is it actually helps relieve 
sore muscles, it promotes blood flow. And the research says that it's not going to help improve your performance, but it is going to help improve recovery. And remember that when we do exercise, you know, we, we essentially damage the muscles and that's what helps, helps build muscle strength and, and muscle size. So, so the answer is yes, it can help. And there are simple ways of doing that. You're, you're bound to see if you go to a gym or a sports club, people with these massage rollers mm, yeah. um, that you can use all, all on the muscles all around the body. Mm -hmm. um, or actually a, a simple technique is just to use a tennis ball and, and okay. to roll your foot yeah. you know, over, over the tennis ball. That, that will do the same thing. So uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Okay. Another sports related <laughs> question. It's crazy. So is a healthy weight needed to run a marathon? All these sports <laughs> questions, I've been quite exhausted. Yeah, no. yeah. Yeah. Um, the answer is no, it isn't mm -hmm. necessary to run a marathon. However, it is beneficial, obviously, mm -hmm. to be a healthy weight if you're going to do any sort of um, sport, particularly long distance running. Uh, why specifically with, with long distance running? Well, if you're of a healthy weight, um, you're, you're not going to need so much energy to do the, the marathon, you'll put much less strain on your joints. So you're, I'm thinking about your knees and your ankles. Um, and, and actually, um, larger people don't deliver oxygen around the body as efficiently as, as people who are of a, a healthy weight. Um, so, and the other thing is that you may find actually, if you're uh, of, a, of a healthy weight, you may actually be faster as well. One of the things that um, you know, when you're a, a lean build or a healthy weight is that actually you burn carbohydrates uh, more efficiently as well. So the target would obviously be be of a healthy weight, but don't let that put you off if you are overweight from, from training to, to run marathons or, or to do sport. Many people who are carrying a bit of extra weight do very well and actually then through the training they lose that extra weight. Okay, one last question. Is guess, it a sport? It's guess a sport what? Yeah, one. okay. So can playing racquetball too often lead to knee problems? Well, the simple answer is, is playing any sport too often can lead to joint problems. Racquetball um, is, is one sport where it can lead to knee problems, but not necessarily. It doesn't have to. I mean, if, you, if you're unfit, you're more likely to suffer accidental injury. If you overdo it because, you know, you're enthousi too enthusiastic or maybe we're what called, you know, we're what called a, you know, a weekend warrior where you only play intensively for an hour or two on a weekend and do nothing else during the week. Um, so it's like any sport really, so that's why it's very important to do the, the, the warm-ups. It's very important to know your limits, your limitations, and not just keep going for the sake of keeping going, and making sure that you do your stretches afterwards. Essentially, enjoy playing whatever sport you do, but you know, listen to your body. Thank you so much, Rob, and we'll have lots more questions for you next week. And I'm going to finish Thank my you. tea. And you finish your tea, you've done well today, as usual. And if you have a question for Dr. Rob Hicks, you can email us on doctor at chrissybshow.tv. Now, don't go away, because after the break, we'll be sharing the story of Paul Skates, whose harrowing journey of abuse led him speaking out about the importance of casting aside taboos and talking to each other about mental health struggles. We'll see you after this break. to the Chrissy B Show everyone. So we hope you've enjoyed today's program where we've had on Enough Abuse, the organization dedicated to preventing child abuse through teaching preventative measures. We've also been joined by Chelsea Baker who has given us a great insight into her initiative National Mentoring Day. Chris Brown gave us some tips on dealing with egos and Dr. Rob Hicks has been answering your most pressing medical questions. And now for the part, final part of our show, we're going to show you a video from Head Talks, a mental health podcast that focuses on shedding light on people's personal struggles with mental health and today we'll be hearing from Paul Skates who relives the trauma and subsequent mental breakdown of being abused as a child in order to raise awareness on how important it is to talk about your struggles. Here he is. So I experienced mental health, um, my first experience of mental health, I was very young actually, I was nine years old and I remember experiencing this kind of distorted view that everybody and anybody around me was out to cause me harm. Now it kind of was triggered by the fact that I was abused as a child by a 
in inverted commas, so-called family friend. Um, but my mind became very polluted with very kind of distorted thoughts. I mean, some of it might have been slightly child dreamlike, but I used to believe that when I went to sleep, people would turn into these kind of skeletal creatures. But I also had this true belief that everybody was going to kill me because of, obviously, I'd had this abuse going on and it had been very much apparent from the individual that they were going to kill me or my family if I ever spoke out. You know, it was somebody that I loved, somebody I trusted. He'd groomed the whole family for two years before he ever didn't think this is what they do. They're very clever and sophisticated. And I just remember the first time it happened, I woke up in the darkness of the night and all of a sudden, I didn't know who was there. I could just feel the hands and I could feel the breathing and I just froze. I didn't know what to do. And it just, that's where I think I learned a response of anxiety because I don't even know how you can quantify it to somebody who's never experienced. But if you all of a sudden, you know if somebody shouts at somebody and it kind of shocks them, it's like that. I just froze, didn't know who it was, didn't know what was going on, and I was just there. And then eventually the person exited the room, and then I just kind of almost, I, th I think I'd almost gone off somewhere. So there's a thing called disassociation, and I think my mind had learned to somehow, in that frozen moment, go somewhere whilst it went on. You know, for many years, I hated anybody questioning who I was. I, I mean, I have no photos of my childhood. Um, I only have photos now as an adult because I couldn't bear to look at myself. They diagnosed me with body dysmorphic disorder. I, I went and saw about 15 different cosmetic surgeons. I wanted to completely change the way I looked. Thankfully, no cosmetic surgeon would touch me with a barge pole because they could clearly see what was going on. This wasn't just somebody who wanted to kind of improve their look. This was somebody who wanted to, if I could have, changed my face completely, I would have at that point. I became my own abuser. I started to abuse myself, it had become what my brain had learned. As uncomfortable as it was, it was more normal to be cruel to myself. So I used to punch myself in the face. I used to do all sorts of things, you know, and this is where I think sometimes we need to educate people around Sometimes, and I'm not excusing bad behaviour, but you know, I used to go out when I was in my 18, 19 sort of years of age and incite a physical violent attack on me. So I'd take on, little old me would take on five bouncers. There's no way I was going to win, but it was almost reinforcing when I got abused. That that's what, yeah, it's because I'm not good enough and that's what I'm there for. Even though I'd kind of gone out and seeked that approval, it reinforced that actually I'm a nasty person inside. And that stayed with me from the age of eight till I was 30. I took myself along to um, a well-known hospital in central London um, and presented and said, I need help, I feel like I'm going mad. Um, the psychiatric nurse at the time, I laugh about it now, but said to me, if you were going mad, trust me, son, you wouldn't know about it. And I, it, that didn't help me at all. That just reinforced that actually, you really don't understand what's going on in my mind. I really am going mad, etc., etc. And actually I was looking for somebody to say, Right, come here, we can help you. This is, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna help you solve what's going on and all this distortion. Because it's almost like sitting next to the M25 day in, day out with all this traffic and this noise going on in your head and all this noise telling you you're a person, you're crap, you're this, you're ugly, you're everything about you, your parents would be better off if you're dead. Anyway, I went along, got this response of, you know, you're not going mad and you need to go back to your GP and you need to get referred. Three minutes was too long. So to wait three months to go to the GP, then get the re correct referral and all that, I was just like, I can't do this. I cannot do this. And I remember sitting on the window ledge and just thinking, you've got to do this, Paul. You need to do this. There is no other way. You're, d you're bearing in mind because of what had happened, I just thought, do you know what? Somebody's gonna kill me if I don't kill myself and I'd rather do it myself because it's the one thing I've got control over because everything else in my life, I have no control over it. And my poor parents, you know, so anyway, I jumped, I broke my back, I was paralyzed, bed bound for 10 months, and oh my God, then the psychosis really kicked in because I tell you now, humor's got me through mental health. So sometimes I do bring in humor, you know, daytime TV is enough to bring anybody a mental health problem, trust me. When all you've got is daytime TV, and I was, uh, you know, I, I couldn't move, so my mother, bless her, before she'd go off to work, she'd make sure I had a peapot, you know, I had water and stuff, she'd go off to work, she'd come back at lunchtime and sort of check in on me. Because I had a plaster cast from here to here. I couldn't wash, I couldn't do anything, I had to rely on them for everything, which, again, it was so degrading because, you know, people said, oh, it's so lucky for you to be alive. It didn't feel lucky. I had all the guilt, I was laden with the guilt. No, my parents were not making me feel guilty at all. They, you know, they just said, you know, what could we have done? And I said, there's nothing you could have done. My parents, bless them, you know, if it wasn't for my parents, I wouldn't be here today. 
Um, they were my, you know, my kind of knight in shining armour. Um, they were the torchbearers that lit that light of hope um, because they just gave me what I needed, which was support, stability and some kind of security that we don't know how we're going to get there, but we're going to get there. And it took years, years and years and years of psychology. So I had medication. I've taken, I probably have taken every single medication they could possibly prescribe to people. I've also taken my own self-medication route, and that's what I did from the age of 13 till, till I was in my mid-twenties. I self-prescribed, because actually I didn't know how else to stop all this in my head. Um, you know, and the, the thing that frustrated me was, people were telling me taking drugs was bad for you, but then on the other hand, I had psychiatrists that were basically, in my mind, legalised drug dealers, because they were handing them out like smarties. And I kept saying, look, I'm not being disrespectful, but I do not want to walk around like a zombie. And you may want me to just be quiet and go away and just take these tablets and not deal with this trauma that I've experienced. But actually, do you know what? I need to feel this. So, you know, any form of abuse, whether it's sexual or any form of abuse whatsoever, when somebody's conditioned a certain way and it's sustained over many, many years, and for mine it was eight years, it becomes a belief and you become brainwashed, and that's what happened. And the therapeutic intervention allowed me to understand the chain analysis. Okay, where did this start? What's gone on? And what's driving it? And what was driving it was anxiety, but also fear. Anybody that's watching this and is experienced similar to what I've experienced or is experiencing it right now, if I was to talk to my younger self, I would speak up. I would find that one person that I trusted that had my best interests at heart and I would ask for help. Because I truly believe, had I seen somebody like myself talking when I was 13 years old and making me realise that actually what I'm going through is perfectly normal for what I've gone through, then I probably wouldn't have got to the stage where I had to try and kill myself. Because I would have understood. And I think this is where the problem is. We don't talk about mental health. I talk about it now as mental wealth, but do you know what, if somebody had said to me, this is not normal what's going on, but it's normal for somebody that's experiencing what you're experiencing, then my life would have been probably very different. Thank you very much to Head Talks for that video. And if you'd like to know more about them, please do head over to our website, chrissybshow.tv, and you can click on our contributor section. So now I'm going to be giving you a few tips on what you can do to actually help give back to society in some way. Now, we saw two great initiatives earlier with Marilyn Halls from Enough Abuse and also Chelsea Baker with National Mentoring Day. And of course, they're making a big impact on people's lives. And you might say to yourself, oh, I'd love to be able to also make a difference, but what can I do? you know I can't spend any money I'm, um, I don't see myself doing anything big or grand well you don't actually have to do anything huge to help other people there are some things that you can do that are free that aren't going to cost you anything and won't take up too much of your time as well depending on what it is and there were some um, actual suggestions printed in the Guardian newspaper and here's some of the things that they suggest that everyone can do the first one is to of course give blood so most people between the age of 17 and 65 can give blood and with men able to donate every three months and women every four. So the actual most time consuming part is finding your local donor centre and setting up an appointment but actually the, the process of giving blood takes as little as 10 minutes sometimes. So if you are prepared to commit yourself and do that every now and then that will be really good. The second thing that they suggest is to sign up to the British Bone Marrow Registry. So to register, you need to be between 18 and 49 years old and already be a blood donor. And you can ask to have your blood checked for tissue type the next time you go to give blood. So that's something else that you could consider. The next one, which I know is a little bit controversial sometimes, is to register as an organ donor. So um, the Guardian rightly says, you're not gonna need your organs when you're dead. And, only actually 29% of people have actually joined the register. So, you know, for those of you that want to do this, you should obviously carry around the um, donor card with you at all times. The next thing that the Guardian suggests, which I absolutely love this one, 
to raise puppies for guide dogs for the blind. So uh, the idea is that each puppy lives with you as a volunteer from six weeks of age until it's about 12 to 14 months old. And the aim is to actually produce a well-behaved, friendly and responsive dog that will be ready for the training later on. So you as a volunteer will get to teach him or her basic obedience like sit, stay, come and walk on a lead. And that gets the puppy accustomed to different environments, maybe town centres, country lanes, even public transport. So you might say to yourself, well, I can't really afford a puppy but basic equipment such, uh, such as vet spills and food costs are actually covered by the charity and obviously with the hardest part probably being ha having to give the puppy back for training afterwards so if you're the, maybe the type of person that gets really attached quickly to, to things maybe this is not the best thing but if you kind of remember that this is for charity you are um, raising this puppy to be to really help someone later on then you know hopefully you'll be able to give the puppy back afterwards uh, the next thing that the Guardian are suggesting is to donate your not so old PC or Mac. So Computers for Charities has recycled more than 250,000 computer systems and distributed them to 105 countries. But legislation requires that to qualify for recycling, the equipment must be less than five years old and in full working order. So a few things that you can consider there, especially the puppy one. Well, everyone, we have reached the end of today's program, but if you have a story that you would like to share or you'd like to ask us a question or you have any comments about the program, please do email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet us at chrissybshow or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. And if you'd like to find out more about me, you can visit my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Thank you.